Hi, John here from the Historic Game Shop. In this video I'm going to look at the games played in the 14th and 15th centuries. Many of the games that were played in the 11th to the 13th centuries were still popular. Nine Men's Morris as well as Three, Twelve, Five and Six Men's Morris were still being played, as was Alkirki, though this game begins to evolve into drafts at the end of the 15th century, though the rules are only settled down by the end of the Tudor period. The Viking game of Nefertafel is becoming less popular, though probably still being played in the more rural western fringes of Britain. Rithmamachia was still popular amongst the mathematically educated. Tables boards became hinged so that they could be folded, first with leather straps and then with metal hinges. Points were often inlaid and the borders mitred. It is still likely that a range of games was being played on the tables board, though early forms of backgammon like games appear. Chess pieces were mostly turned on lathes and so made from wood, which rarely survives, though there are a number of good illustrations from this period, especially after the printing press was invented in the mid-15th century. This meant that many copies of books were made and therefore the chance of survival was greater. By the late 15th century the first knights represented by carved horses' heads appear, though both the rook and the bishop have elaborate forms of the earlier medieval pieces. I have made short videos on both the evolution of tables games and chess, which you can watch. The 1430s also saw the first playing cards in Europe. Their popularity spread quickly, and by the end of the century cards and card games were in all levels of society. The hare game and fox and geese are both asymmetric games, that is, the two players having different men on the board and different ways of winning. Both use blocking as a technique for one of the sides to win, in both cases the side with most men. The side with least men, or even one man, has the role of escaping capture in these games. The dominant attackers in the Tafel games also use blocking to capture the king, as can be seen in my video on Viking and Anglo-Saxon games. The hare game sets one hare against three hunters. The hunters have to move forwards, diagonally forwards or sideways, but not backwards, in order to trap the hare at one end of the board. The hare can move in any direction and has to get past the hunters in order to escape. The game begins like this, with the hare winning by escaping to the end of the board and the hunters trapping the hare at the other end of the board. There is a pattern of moves that allows the hunters to win, though this is not easy to work out or to execute without making mistakes. Fox and Geese makes its first appearance in the 14th century, probably the earliest evidence being the cloisters at Gloucester Cathedral. The game sets a gaggle of 13 geese against a single fox. The board is set out like this at the start of the game. A single goose and the fox move alternately each turn to a single adjacent position. The role of the geese is to move forwards, always attempting to evade capture and to block the fox into a corner, though less easily the fox can be captured anywhere on the board. The fox can catch the geese by the short leap, that is jumping over a single goose to a vacant position immediately beyond. Capture geese come off the board. More than one goose can be captured in a single move, so long as there is a vacant position between each of them. The fox can change direction between multiple catches. The aim of the fox is to capture enough of the geese such that he cannot be blocked. There are diagonal lines as well as orthogonal lines on the board. It is possible to restrict either the geese or the fox to just the orthogonal lines, which gives advantage to the other side using both. This can be useful when playing young or inexperienced players. Though the game for the geese does not always seem easy, especially when the game is first played, for experienced players the geese should always win the game. Because of this, much tampering with the game occurred during the height of its popularity in the 17th century. I'll discuss this in the video on the 17th and the 18th century games. Now to the game with no name. This game belongs to a family of games which has relatives in North Africa and Scandinavia. It probably has its origins in the melting pot of game evolution in the early post-Roman Mediterranean area where routes to the north up the river systems of Europe saw a flourishing trade. 
The game of tab and related games in North Africa suggests the success of this side of the family near to its origins. However, there is evidence of the game being played in Novgorod in northwest Russia in the later medieval period, as well as evidence for it being played in Britain from the late 13th century. This manuscript, from Cern Abbey in Dorset, from the 13th century, shows the game alongside Nymens Morris and Alkirki. There are other finds from archaeological sites within the medieval ports from the 14th and 15th century. The find of a cask head on the Mary Rose, Henry VIII's warship sunk in Portsmouth Harbour in 1545, is the last known find of the game in Britain. A game known as Daldos, with a very similar board, is known in Scandinavia from a few coastal sites around 1800. This evidence suggests the game originated in the Mediterranean and moved up in some form or another to Novgorod and probably into coastal Scandinavia and down the trading routes of the Baltic Sea to Britain where it was mostly a game played by sailors. Unfortunately, as far as we know, the game has not been mentioned by name in any medieval manuscript, so we are calling it the game with no name. The rules only survive from the Scandinavian game of Daldos, and while we cannot be certain the rules were exactly this in the 14th and 15th centuries, they were probably very similar. These are the rules of play. Two four-sided dice are used with the numbers 1, 2, 3 and 4 on their long sides. The board is set out like this at the start of play. All the counters have a plain side and a marked side. Players have to roll a 1 to be able to turn the counter over starting with the one closest to the square end of the board. A roll of a 1 at any time can be used to turn counters over, but this must be done in sequence from the square end of the board. A roll of a pair of 1s allows for a free turn. On the roll of the dice, counters move down their side of the board and across to the middle, up the middle line to the pointy end and then down their opponent's side. Once they reach the square end, they go back up the middle and retrace their steps down their opponent's side. Counters never go back to their own side once they have reached the middle line. Capture is by replacement, meaning that if a counter lands on an opponent's counter, it replaces it. The opponent's counter comes off the board and does not come back into play. The roll of the two dice are used separately, even if moving one counter, but can be used to move two counters. So, for example, a roll of a 1 and a 4 can be used to turn over one counter and move another four positions up the middle line. A counter is not allowed to jump over one of its own counters, but can jump over opposing counters. There is strategy as well as luck. Rolling lower numbers can be used to capture as many men as possible while travelling down the opponent's side, while the larger numbers can be used to move quickly up the middle line. The winner is the player who's left surviving on the board with either most of their counters or just one. Thank you for watching this video. These games, as well as many others, as well as playing cards and dice, can be found on our website.